move on to the uh, final portion of the program for this morning. The unauthorized practice of law by landmen, current issues with Richard Atkins and George Mason. Um, hey, Westgate, <laughs> did you have the, are you going to? You guys figure out what you need to do. All right, with some introductions, uh, Richard Atkins has over 20 years of hands-on professional experience as a mineral land man in the Appalachian and Illinois basins. He's the owner of Atkins and Associates Land Services, a full-service land company that provides complete oil and gas and coal-related project management, leasing agents, right-of-way agents, and abstracting and title reviews personnel. He has a wide range of experience in all facets of mineral land work to include mineral title reports, surface title reports, title curative, acquisitions, investitures, due diligence, JOAs, and JV partnerships. Excuse me, joint ventures. Drill site title reports, competitive lease reports, division orders and royalty management, mineral estate research, airships, and genealogy research and more. Richard also owns and operates Appalachian Mineral Ventures, LLC, and is a principal in Appalachian Basin Group, LLC, both of which offer mineral and land brokerage services to the energy and financial industry. George Mason is the principal of George Mason Law Firm, PSC, in Lexington, Kentucky. He represents companies and individuals who want to develop oil and gas, coal bed methane, and Marcellus and Utica shale properties. Based on extensive experience in negotiating and drafting oil and gas and CBM legislation and regulations, he advises clients on the actual and potential impacts on operations from energy and environmental and tax initiatives. George received his BA and JD from the University of Kentucky where he's a member of the Kentucky Law Journal. He's licensed to practice in Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. He's admitted to practice before the U.S. District Court of Kentucky and Virginia. Southern District of West Virginia, U.S. Capital, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth and Sixth Circuits, and the U.S. Supreme Court. He served as the Assistant General Counsel of Massey Energy Corporation, and prior to that, was the Vice President and General Counsel of Equitable Production Company, now EQT, before starting his own law firm. George is a trustee of the Energy and Mineral Law Foundation, has spoken at numerous EMLF seminars in the Kentucky Mineral Law Conference. George has been an adjunct professor of law at the Sam P. Chase College of Law, Northern Kentucky University, where he also taught oil and gas and coal law. He is a member of the advisory board for the Virginia Center for Coal and Energy Research at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. And with that, who's going to begin? Who's going to begin? With that, we'll begin with uh, our friend George Mason. I was going to say that uh, if you all want to uh, clear out a room, just invite us back. As you can see, the flood of people that left. <laughs> so for this last topic, of course, they always have the last for best. So the first, I'm going to have uh, Rich go ahead and use a toggle switch. And this is before you get started. If you've ever read anything, hold on, don't uh, turn it yet. Anything, the disclosures, what have you, from the Securities and Exchange Commission, they always have the first item is, you know, about a warning. All right, this is our warning. <laughs> All right, and this comes straight from my son who said, oh, Dad, you are so boring. And I said, well, at least it pays the rent. So as it... George, if I could, am I on here? Do oh. we have a volume? If I could jump in, uh, even though this content is boring, we do kind of take a little comedy uh, with this, so we appreciate everybody's good-natured uh, approach to that. It is going to turn into a little bit of a landman versus lawyers kind of thing up here, but... It all is done in good nature, and we try to make this boring content a little more humorous by doing so. And of course, I usually, everybody wants to be an attorney, and everybody wants to make jokes of attorneys. So you're going to see, as uh, we're playing different roles here, he decided to show up in a pinstriped suit, and I decided to show up as a landman, just with my landman jacket and golf shirt. He's a well-dressed landman, though, i got to say. <laughs> And if any of y'all know George, you know, George is Mr. Dapper here, so as I was coming in this morning, I saw somebody out there, and oh, you're the pinstripe suit and the wingtip shoes, and 
you know some fancy Latin words. Well, sir, you must be a lawyer. Well, actually, I'm a lowly land man, but is that the unauthorized practice of law, George, wearing a pinstripe? Not as long as you're with me. So, in West Virginia, probably. All right. All right. As this is what you'll feel like as a result of this hour presentation. So this is where we expect you to be shortly. <laughs> All in a day's work. And then the next one, Rich, I'll leave off to you. Well, even though we do have some levity and, and comedy into this, we do want to bring these issues to your attention. Um, uh, unauthor unauthorized practice of law has probably been issues since there's been the authorized practice of law in a lot of jurisdictions. As far as we know, there's not a lot of, it's not a burning issue here in Kentucky, but it is a burning issue in some neighboring states, uh, especially in West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania, a little bit to a lesser extent in Illinois and Indiana. But it is an issue that we can expect to see a little bit more of going forward, especially if these shell plays continue to gain some success and if we do get a rebound in some activity. Um, George and I, like many of the folks in this room, are also survivors or of the uh, Marcellus and Utica boom. So we've seen kind of the development of these things in a lot of areas. Um, and again, we can expect probably the same approach here. Um, any landman, most folks in this room either are landmen or, or employ or contract with landmen, any good landman worth his or her salt tend to be problem solvers. You want folks that, that you can say, this is the parcel I need to lease, this is you know, what I want to pay for it, these are the terms and conditions and the royalty, you want to spin those folks up and turn them loose and go get your lease. Uh, the first beginning premise for that with the landman is to build a sense of trust with those landowners or mineral owners or the business folks in some cases that you're dealing with. And that can be abused on both sides sometimes because some landowners are more than willing to enter into a real trusting relationship. These days it's getting a lot harder to build that trust but that trust can be a two-edged sword because a lot of times, once the trust is, is maintained and built there, they may look to the landman for a lot of advice in a lot of areas that we're just really not savvy, that we're not qualified to speak to. Uh, an authorized practice of law comes into that in a lot of ways and forms. We're going to look at some scenarios a little bit later on in the, in the presentation, kind of give you some ideas of how that can happen. Those scenarios are tailored towards landmen. George and I have been studying this uh, topic for uh, several months now. We did a presentation back in December about it. I'm also plugged into the AAPL, which American Association of Professional Landmen is really following this across the country. And it, you get in the more mature basins across the country, such as mid-continent, Louisiana, Texas, Colorado, uh, these issues are, have been going on for a long time. And it initially comes down to just a couple of uh, main topics, but we're going to look at all, uh, both of those here in just a moment. But as a landman, it is a good idea to stay within your area of expertise and not to abuse that trust that you build with your landowners. If you look at our graphic here, um, I was involved in a, a new Albany shell play uh, eight or nine years ago in western Kentucky and southern Illinois. We had a pretty large brokerage done with about 30 guys out leasing every day. Uh, abstractors in the courthouse, so it was really out of the box, let's go get some acreage really quick situation. And every Monday we had a meeting, we'd turn in our leases and our, our cursory title reports and our orders of payment. We had one guy though that just heads and shoulders above everybody for three or four weeks running and was turning in you know, four or five times more leases than any of these guys. And there were some really good landmen and, and leasing agents on that project. Well, this went on for about a month, and then we get a phone call. It came to the crew chief, and then he came up to me, and then up to our lead broker, kind of explaining what this guy was doing. So what the guy's M.O. was, he would drive out to the farm or the driveway and pull up, and he, he never did go to the door. He would always make sure that he drove around long enough until he got noticed. Then he would get out with a surveying stake and a ribbon and a big sledgehammer and start driving stakes in the ground. And inevitably, the landowner would come down and approach him, you know, what the hell are you doing on my property, buddy? What's this all about? And first thing he would say was, this is where we're going to put the first well. That's going to be the second well right over there. We just, we can't wait to develop your property. And this was in a virgin area that wasn't a lot of historic uh, leasing or legacy production there. That tactic worked pretty well for the guy in the beginning. Of course, he had no idea. We were so upstream in this project, he had no idea where those locations were going to be. Needless to say, that guy went away. Our leasing dropped 
pretty drastically there for a couple of weeks, but we did pick it back up. But that's a good example of you know a landman stepping out of his expertise and uh, again just an unethical approach to it. And really, the unauthorized practice of law by landmen is an ethics issue uh, at its base, and we're going to address some of those issues as we look at some case points here in just a moment, too. All right, I get to, at this point, tell my uh, only landman story, and this is supposedly true like all these other stories. A friend of mine was taking uh, leases for a major company in southwest Virginia about 30 years ago, and so they got a landman that came up from Texas, got off the bus and said, you here are looking at the best landman in all of Texas. Well, two weeks later, after he'd taken oil and gas leases from surface owners, they put him back on the bus so he could go back to Texas to being the best land man in all of Texas. So, the legal description is probably what ran him back, probably. <laughs> um, as a land man, again, the AAPL and, and other organizations look at, at the unauthorized practice of law as basically an ethics issue. And as an AAPL member, you know, us that are AAPL members, we are subscribed to a code of ethics and standard best practices that are constantly being updated. And these are the pertinent sections uh, that do re apply to ethics. Um, I'm going to put a little plug in for the AAPL here. I know we have many folks in the room that are AAPL members. And is Mike Connolly in the room? including a former national AAPL president, which might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're the only guy from the east of the Mississippi River that has been our AAPL national president. We want to commend you on that. I, th I think that's going to change pretty soon with all the activity we've been having over in these basins the last couple of years. But uh, AAPL is a great organization. Again, we do have a code of ethics, and there is a censorship uh, process through there that if code uh, violations are reported, to the local association, there's a peer review that goes on. Um, there's not a lot of those that are reported, but they are occasionally uh, issues in, in some of the busier areas especially. And then that gets moved on up to the AAPL national member, and that, that member can be removed or censored. Uh, again, there's no legal ramifications per se, but it, it, does, it is a blow to their industry reputation. That is one of the benefits, I believe, in using AAPL uh, members. If you do have landmen on staff that you use uh, that are not AAPL members, I'd encourage you to have them sign up with our local groups, the Appalachian Association. Uh, we meet every quarter. Uh, again, uh, the national program has a lot of good certification and continuing education programs that are beneficial and at the end of the day provides a better product, product for you and your, your companies. All right, now we're going to have an overview at first of three states, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, and then we'll get into the weeds on each of those. So here you see West Virginia, and you'll have to remember that the attorneys must be directly involved with all aspects of real estate transactions, including the search of public records, contract searches, should be done by or under the supervision of a West Virginia attorney. All right, now an overview of Ohio. Uh, attorney licensed to, to practice law in Ohio must prepare deeds, power of attorneys, and other instruments that are to be recorded. Now here you'll see one exception is that a party to the transaction may prepare an instrument in which they are a party. And a non-attorney may prepare that document to be recorded. But also it gets back to, in the very last line I want to bring out, that you'll find not in West Virginia, a non-attorney may perform searches and examinations, sign documents, and close transactions. All right, just an overview. And then now to Kentucky. Laypersons may conduct real estate closings but may not answer legal questions that arise in the closing or offer any legal advice to the parties. However, preparation of deeds and mortgages constitutes the practice of law must be prepared by an attorney. What I saw, thought was fascinating was the next line, preparation is also considered as filling in blanks on a pre-printed forms. All right, before we go on, we have a little and, levity and, in between. And you notice that that doesn't, uh, doesn't mention leases or other instruments right. at this point, but it could be just a small jump over to that. All right. If you see a lawyer crossing with no speed limit, I encourage you to speed up, actually. <laughs> And, and this is a baby picture of George when he was a kid over there on the, on the right. But look at the top first. I like this. this. You can find anything on the web now. I like this. There are basic themes to life in the 90s, as you would 
2010, 2020. The perpetual war of the sexes, lawyers, the economy, lawyers, liberal extremists, conservative extremists, religious extremists, lawyers, the media, and more lawyers. So anyway, this is a collection of, and I just pulled out several of the attorney cartoons to keep you all awake, interested and excited about this program. So, And, and George, before we jump into the West Virginia advisory opinion, which just recently, there's two, there was one in 2007 and one more recently that came up as a result of a, a court case in, uh, what was it, Braxton County? Or Brook County. Brook County, I think it was. Um, in West Virginia, it's basically came down to uh, do the attorneys want us to work under them or, or, or do they do land men need some sort of supervision under a legal professional? In Ohio, it's been more of a registration type issue, which that's the most common issue we see in a lot of places in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and other areas. Uh, they want us to be registered like a, a real estate agent would be registered or some sort of broker. But in West Virginia, it's a little different, and it's, it's very concerning to us as landmen in the AAPL, uh, something we definitely need to keep our eye on. And George is going to speak to some advisory opinions and some court cases in West Virginia that, that may get you a little alarmed when you start hearing about them. Of course, you can see the first one up, you know, advisory opinion 2007-1. You know, what gets me is that uh, here's locating heirs and having them sign quit claim deeds and leases. And then could it be plainer that the unlawful practice committee would not hesitate to find that the non-lawyer was engaged in the unauthorized practice of law? And from a practical standpoint, I think all of us in here realize and appreciate the fact that there's a thin line between what landmen do and what attorneys do on a daily basis. And it's always good to have a, a team uh, with your council and your land folks working together to make sure to keep each other out of trouble. But it's, it's you know, again, if you, as you're looking at these West Virginia issues, it may, it, if you take it to the letter of the law, it's almost impossible to have an abstractor go to the courthouse and actually make an interpretation based on, well, that reference and that recital leads me to this deed. You'd almost have to have an attorney standing over your shoulder in every part of the way, I believe, in my opinion. George is going to differ with that problem. All right. Well, uh, same advisory uh, opinion from 2007, the conclusion. And what you'll see, I'll go down to uh, the last line. Seems fit with the prohibition against unauthorized practice of law. Only under the direct supervision and control of an attorney licensed to practice law in West Virginia. So you will see that's the thread that runs so true throughout each one of these cases and advisory opinions. It, actually, a landman cannot would be considered the unauthorized practice of law if he's not under the direct su supervision and control of an attorney licensed to practice law in West Virginia. And uh, I want to point out that one of the pertinent issues here it says until the issue is addressed by the West Virginia legislature, the advisory opinion is the advisory opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, George, but the State Bar Association is an arm of the Supreme Court of yes. West Virginia. So it does have some bearing there, but as far as a legal precedent, I think it's more advisory than it actually advisory. books, laws on the books. That's kind of the AAPL and MLBC local chapters approach to this, is until the legislature acts, and every time the legislature meets, there's a couple of different uh, legislators will introduce a bill trying to do something with us mean landmen, you know, to try to get us under control. Uh, but I, last year I was approached by two different clients that I was working for in West Virginia saying, should we be concerned about this issue in West Virginia? Uh, we're going to look at this McMahon case, which was what most of that was predicated upon, the fear was predicated on. And of course, uh, my pat answer is always, well, until the legislature acts, I think we're okay. If we do have West Virginia counsel, we do want to plug into that and make sure they're aware of what we're doing and work under them. A lot of companies are not based in West Virginia. They're in Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma. They may or may not have attorneys in-house that are licensed to practice law in West Virginia. Uh, so they can't say, well, the argument is you're working under our attorneys. If they're not practiced or a member of the bar of the state Virginia or West Virginia bar, they're not under the applicable rules, I think. That's correct. All right, All right. here is the, there uh, is exhibit McMahon cases goes about 20, 25 pages, and uh, any of these cases I reference, uh, give me your address, you know, email address, and I'll send it to you. So take a, a minute to look at this, 
And it talks not about a landman, but a lay person. And this will come next in the next slide. And it goes through uh, engaged in the unlawful practice of law when performing a title search, a search, review or inspection of records, and providing any certificate, notes, handwritten or otherwise, abstract, summary, opinion, guarantee, verbal verification, and a report of any kind or nature as to the status or marketability of real estate title and or reflecting matters of record? The answer is yes, that's the unlawful practice of law. If it's not done under the direct supervision or control of an attorney licensed to practice in West Virginia. All right, now to number five, and I put this, the, the others have to do with um, real estate uh, closings and what have you. So I thought this is, to me, the most unreasonable, illogical result of all of this is a lay person not under the direct supervision or control of an attorney licensed practice law in the state of West Virginia engaged in the unlawful practice of law by mailing or hand carrying instruments to the courthouse after the real estate closing for recording when the recordation of instruments takes place as a part of real estate transaction. It says layperson. You know, I think it would be easy, a segue, that layperson, everybody's thinking, well, that's a landman. Well, it could include, what about the mailman? You know, what about the UPS? It's pretty broad. Person? We don't about the FedEx or any third part because they're not under the direct supervision and control of an attorney licensed in West Virginia. So to me, this is a ludicrous you know, result that you could have being both so hidebound on this when, and I understand what they're trying to do is to ensure that you don't have people out there that are trying to do title searches, give title opinions, what have you, you know, on anything that has to do with real estate in West Virginia. And I can speak to that from first-hand experience in West Virginia over the years. Uh, since the Marcellus rush, you know, the last seven or eight, nine years, uh, some companies were really quick to jump to use a, a, a landman to do ownership reports or different things, not necessarily a title opinion or certificate of title, but they did try to send out as much work to the landmen as they could to keep the billable hours down at the, at the law firms. And I think that's probably one of the reasons the State Bar of West Virginia is on this. Uh, again, it, it could be seen as you know, kind of taking some business away or cannibalizing their business. That said, there are pertinent issues that are very serious that I think do need to be addressed. It's not just economics, just the attorneys trying to get richer. All right, the next one. If anybody has any questions we go through, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to address them, but your answer may appear later in our program. All right. Next one. All right, this is continuing on an advisory opinion 2010-02, talks about real estate title examination, real estate closings are the practice of law and cannot be conducted by a lay person unless one, that person is under the direct supervision control of a licensed lawyer, you know, in West Virginia, you know, or the layperson conducts such activities on behalf of his regular employer set forth herein. And something that uh, has come up also is what is the direct supervision and control? Is it like if you're based in Charleston, which is Kanawha County, but you're going up to Morgantown, Monongalia County, if I pronounced it correctly, is that beyond the, the span of control, direct supervision and control, or is it the next county? So, you know, I mean, you, you can get in all kinds of permutations of what is direct supervision and control. All right, in 2010-2, in the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Brook Court opinion went up to them and they found that the findings of the circuit court of Brook County were plainly right. I'd much have preferred if instead of saying plainly right, if they had gone ahead and enunciated exactly, even though they said that uh, circuit court judge was correct, I'd be more comfortable if they actually, even if it was word for word, came out with an order, this is exactly our expectations. And keep in mind with this McMahon case, we're not no longer talking about just an advisory opinion. We've got precedential case law in place now that says that all those broad acts by a layperson, which would also include landmen, 
or the unauthorized practice of law. So now we've got a case on the books that's been held on appeal uh, that, that actually is out there. All right, the next one is a relatively new case, February 26, 2014, U.S. District Court, Northern Division of West Virginia. And I'll let you see, this was a, a class action case, and actually it certified, I want to say something like eight issues, but the one that was, that's most interesting for us is this, whether Lending Tree's witness-only closings constituted the unauthorized practice of law. And here are some of the, and I don't know how to pronounce the uh, plaintiff's name, so we'll just go by with plaintiff. He borrowed, what, over $100,000 from Home Loan Center, loan refinancing, and then the Harry Karenbauer, I guess is how he pronounced his name, no republic gauged uh, by a third party to gather signatures, went to the plaintiff's residence to witness plaintiff sign necessary loan documents. Mr. Karenbauer presented the documents to plaintiff, the plaintiff signed the documents. And here are some of the individual facts, and just take a minute to read them is that, you know, I, I think plaintiff uh, counsel are always looking for the, fir you know, the perfect plaintiff. And that's usually a widow woman that's on Social Security or something like that that makes up the best bad facts against the defendant. And though I didn't put it in here, that this uh, plaintiff, I think, was born in the Netherlands, went in the Navy at age 15, had limited English. And then the bottom line you can see is that I uh, say that the attorney would have explained to him what an adjustable rate mortgage was and that his interest rate was set to increase to 12% with the new loan, frustrating his intention in getting the loan, which was to decrease his interest rate. So you go, go before a jury with facts like these and what's the end result? And that you're going to get handed a plaintiff's verdict. And then you can see... Uh, and this is just coming out of the court case, which is pretty lengthy, about witness-only closings conducted by a notary public who is not a lawyer. And the whole thing is that he never gave him legal advice. Uh, you know, it just uh, told him where to sign. But if he had been an attorney, then he could have play, explained the legal ramifications of all the documents, you know, that he was signing. And he could have done it in Latin also. <laughs> Not George? Of course. Was he, would, he, would an attorney be required to make that explanation? Well, it would probably, if it's under the direct supervision and control, I could see it at an attorney's office, you know, where uh, the attorney could come in and explain each of the items, you know, as, as being would part of the... If he didn't explain those items, then would he be... Would he be negligent or liable for not explaining it? Well, he didn't explain anything. And this actually just said for him, you know, where he should sign on the dotted well, line. It, it, it begs the question, Steve. Sure yeah, it begs, you know. It certainly begs that question. Exact same thing. Would that have been, a, would that have been an issue? If, if the attorney had been there, you wouldn't have this case, I don't think. Now, he may have come back and said, hey, he didn't explain about this as a variable rate. It went up to 12%, even though he was an attorney there. So you could still have that pitfall. And again, keep in mind, this is a mortgage and real estate transaction related issue, but it still falls under the broad title of unauthorized practice of law in West Virginia, which can be carried over to what we do on a daily basis also. All right. Here is the discussion continued. And I won't dwell on this, but really it goes in as a class action lawsuit, really goes into the detail of these type of closing, whether there was fraud committed, and many other issues. Um, and the last one uh, item, notwithstanding the standardization of real estate closing documents, the settlement uh, agent may not present important legal documents of the seller, buyer, borrower, or lender at the closing without legal questions being asked and without giving legal advice. So. And then the last part is the opinion, and you can read that, closing of real estate loans by persons who are not licensed attorneys, who are not acting under the direct supervision of a licensed attorney, who are not a bona fide full-time lay employee performing legal services for his or her regular employer constitutes the unlawful practice of law since at least 2013. And 
this I think is the most important is this letter from last August 2014 uh, and it was from Sean Lundy Penn Stewart law firm concerning un unauthorized practice of law questions and he goes through the compilation of, uh, of the uh, fact situation and then they explain McMahon case clearly indicates that title examinations must be conducted by an attorney or another under the direct supervision and control of the attorney. And it's talking about uh, that a disclaimer or disclosure would do nothing but encourage unlawful practice of law by those conducting the search or generating the documentation as described. Number, the second uh, issue that he had about <laughs> Are there any nuances or differences in UPL guidelines for land agents or title searchers, abstracts, who are employees of a company? In other words, can an employee of the company compile the information for my review? If so, would disclosure limitations am I allowed to make in my opinion? And I thought that was interesting about what type of uh, limitations, restrictions you know, that you could have in your opinion. You know, it says if they're for the internal use of the company, only then is it's similar to self-representation. However, if the company is actually engaged in abstract and employees of that company are under the direct supervision and control of the company owners and not the attorney, and if the abstracts are submitted to others as a statement of title or lien status, this is not direct supervision and control. It happened to me when I was doing uh, title opinions for a company in West Virginia that I had certain abstracts that were withdrawn from them because it was a third party, at not, I assume, not under the direct supervision and control of an attorney. So they pulled those back from me and gave me others that had been done internally under their land department, you know, that also had attorneys supervising them so that I could go ahead and do those title opinions. So the only thing I can think of is they, the ones that they withdrew from me from a third party land company they took in-house and either redid them, they may have been correct anyway, and then put them on their stationery, you know, to show that it wasn't a third-party land company. And question three from the letter. Talks about that this is still an open issue. Uh, uh, lastly, I understand I have to supervise anyone that is independent from me in conducting title search upon which I may give an opinion. But is there a rule or definition as to exactly how much and what kind of supervision is required? You know, it's 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 you know under the reasonable direct supervision control. But what is this con? You know, it, it may determine that distance may in and of itself constitute a lack of supervision control depending on the circumstances. Just like I was saying that if you, if the law firm was based in uh, Charleston, but you're doing the title search in uh, Ohio County, Brook County, Buchanan County, uh, Preston County, what have you, would that still be, is that too far a distance that that person would not be under your direct supervision and control? And even as, as it puts in the, in the last sentence, however, simply having the person being supervised within close proximity does not ensure the proper supervision is being conducted. And interlude in between to keep things light sometimes. The top uh, cartoon I couldn't separate from the bottom one. <laughs> Now we're going to move over to some recent activity in Ohio, kind of getting out of West Virginia, which again, the AAPL and, and the local uh, chapter over there, MLBC and Northern Appalachian Landman Association, are really concerned about what's going on in West Virginia. Uh, again, I think we'd all agree it's a pretty broad reach that's going on there based on these advisory opinions in that McMahon case um, as well. And, you know, it, it's something we definitely need to keep our, our fingers on and stay aware of. But in Ohio, it's a little bit different debate going on over there. I don't know how many of you are familiar with back in uh, 2011, 2012, there was this, supposedly there was a book found laying on the ground outside of a landowner's home that had oil and gas talking points and uh, initially.